All right, so we're going to talk about the three different ways that you can capture uh, data changes through Informix and um, do further processing on them that may be outside of uh, the Informix engine altogether. Okay, um, this is a survey, so we won't be going into a lot of depth uh, on each of the three methods, um, but I will cover. Um, after a quick review of all three, um, I will cover some of the API calls that are involved um, just so that you know what to look for and, and what to research. Uh, I'm also, I'll also present some links um, for you to do further research um, on your own. Um, so let's get started. So there are three ways, as I said, to capture changes from your database, uh, and they're all built, really built into Informix. The first one is uh, Change Data Capture, or CDC, um, and then by that I mean the API that Informix presents for Change Data Capture, um, rather than the IBM CDC prog um, application um, that can capture data from, from many applications, including Informix. Uh, the second one is push data triggers, which is also known as smart triggers, um, although smart triggers actually refers to the Java API for the push data triggers. Um, you can access push data triggers from a C application as well, uh, and we'll look at that API specifically. Um, and the third one is asynchronous post commit triggers, uh, which became available in version 14. Okay. Um, so let's go quickly through each of those. Did I get that? Okay. So change data capture uh, provides an API of functions that um, allow applications written in Java, uh, C, uh, embedded SQL C, uh, to capture data um, that's going through the engine. Okay. Um, you register an application. Uh, it will receive notifications when the data you've registered for changes. If somebody does an insert, update, delete um, on that data. Uh, and then you have to um, actively go out and pull the pull the changes back. Okay, so this is partial no notification, partially asynchronous, um, but uh, the actual retrieval of data is an active um, thing that the application has to do. Okay. Um, the second one are push data triggers or smart triggers. So this is, uh, and at the bottom you can see the manual page link uh, where you can read up on that. Um, it is part of uh, enterprise replication, but it doesn't require a lot of ER setup. Um, it does use the enterprise replication snoopers and groupers, <laughs> the background threads that, that manage um, replication for ER, okay? Um, and data is fed to the clients asynchronously by reading the logical logs and sending the data on to the application. And we'll look at the API for that. Okay. And then, whoops, sorry about that. There we go. And the third method is asynchronous post commit data triggers. So this is came about in, in version 14, um, and it basically allows you to create an enterprise replicant that replicates not to a table, but to a stored procedure. That stored procedure can be executing in the same server as the target database or the source database um, through the um, um, loopback replication feature that was an, introduced in the later versions of 12, um, or it can reside in a separate server. Um, and once you've registered for, set up the ER for that, and this is, of the three methods, this requires the most setup uh, and preparation, um, then your applications will get uh, asynchronous notification of every change to the database, um, to those tables and, and specific data that you uh, registered for. Okay? And once you've got that in the stored procedure, uh, the stored procedure can be written in Java, it can be written in SPL, or it can be written in C. Um, if it's an SPL routine, it gets the data in uh, uh, as arguments to the function. Um, and so you have to write a separate function for each set of data that you want to that you want to uh, get retrieve um, because of that. Um, if it's written in Java um, or C, uh, then you can get the data back as uh, JSON records um, and process it that way. And we'll talk about all of this um, as we go through it. Okay. 
Once you've got the data, then you can do whatever you want with it. The stored procedure can pass it on to an external application. Um, if you're written the, the procedure in Java or C, um, it can actually process the data itself and pass it on to MQTT or some home, homegrown application. So let's start with how you configure change data capture, okay, using the API. Um, it's really rather straightforward. Um, in SQL, okay, so you do this really in DB Access. Uh, you could do it in a C program or a Java program. Um, exec function CDC underscore open sess uh, to open a CDC session. Uh, and that will return a session ID, okay? That session ID you need going forward for most of the other um, calls to get the data uh, and complete the setup, okay? Um, the second call is CDC set full row logging, um, because, which you have to set so that you get a full copy of the row for an update, both the pre-image and the post-image. Um, if you don't set full row logging, you'll only get the changed columns, okay? Uh, the pre- and post-images of the changed columns. Um, for most applications, you'll want to set full row logging and get the full rows um, rather than just the changed data. But there will be applications where change data is sufficient. Then you call CDC start capture, um, okay? Um, and then um, you have to activate your session. So start capture actually just kicks off the log position and, and uh, notes uh, the log position for the API. Uh, and then call CDC active session where you're passing in a session ID um, and optionally a log position begin the actual data capture at that position in the logs, okay? Um, and then when you're finished, you call CDC end capture, which stops the data capture, um, and CDC set full row logging to off, um, okay? Um, there are arguments to set full, row, set full row logging and start capture, um, which I didn't present here. Uh, again, they're documented um, in the documentation. Um, and then close CES, CDC close CES to terminate the session um, and stop capture, okay, altogether. That's pretty much the whole thing. It's rather straightforward, um, okay. Um, configuring push data triggers or smart triggers, okay, is also rather simple. Um, the first thing you need to do um, in order to be a client for push data triggers um, the user has to have admin privileges in the sysadmin database. So you will have to ex execute the, the API function grant admin uh, to the username. So in this case, user one um, for replication. Okay. Uh, and that will grant admin privileges on the sysadmin database to that user so that it can be a client to capture um, push data. Okay. Also, uh, since it uses enterprise replication, um, it's going to spool the notifications, the actual data that's being captured by ER has to go somewhere in case your application is not currently connected. Um, so it will spool that into a DB space um, and um, you will need a storage pool in case the space needs to be expanded. If you have a storage pool that's large enough uh, to hold the potential data, then you're done. If not, you could use the API task, uh, API functions, uh, storage pool add to create a storage pool um, or, or an additional storage pool um, for this purpose, okay? And there's the what the call looks like, but again, that's well documented, okay? Once you do that, you need to open a push data session. Um, exec function task, use the API function push data open. Uh, that will return a session ID, okay? Um, and that session ID is needed to call the uh, smart blob API functions in order to retrieve your data events. Um, you register for push data events by calling push data register uh, API function, and you pass in a JSON record, which lists what data you're interested in. You do that by passing in the table, the owner, uh, the database, um, and a query. So you can limit the data that comes back to specific data. Uh, in this case, I'm selecting the UID, card ID, and card data from the credit card transactions table, 
uh, where the amount is greater than 100, greater than or equal to 100. Um, and you can supply a, a, a label, okay? And that label can be the same for multiple um, um, events that you want to capture um, so that you can tie them together. Um, and you can also, you can have different labels for different events so that your uh, application, uh, once it captures the data, can filter different events and process them differently. So that label will be attached to the data that comes back um, from the push data events when they happen. You also need to set, um, or you can set certain level attributes, session level attributes. Um, these are in this call here, push data register um, with a, a um, JSON record that includes the timeout, um, max pending ops and max rex um, attributes. There are others, again, they're well documented. So timeout says, you know, set a 60 second timeout. Um, for uh, data that doesn't arrive to let me know. Uh, max pending zero means send me the data immediately. Don't hold them back. You could set max pending to say 10 so that you, uh, um, the server won't send them to you until it gets 10 events um, that it can send. And max rex is how many uh, events you want ganged into a single JSON record when it's sent back to you, okay? Uh, here we've set it to one, so each event generates one record, okay? Um, if max rex is greater than one, then the JSON record that comes back will contain an array of events uh, inside, okay, in addition to the header information. Um, and we'll see an example of the data in a, in a minute. So now once you've got everything set up, um, the data will be in a smart large object, okay? And so you need to retrieve that. Um, and you do that by calling the IFX LO read uh, function call. Uh, again, this is the C API. The Java API is a little bit different. Um, and we won't be reviewing that today because I'm no Java expert. So I just mess everything up for you guys. Um, so you pass into IFX LO read session ID. Um, the data buff, so that's a buffer to hold the JSON record that comes back. N bytes is the size of the buffer um, and a pointer to an error code uh, that uh, IFX LO read will return if there's an error trying to retrieve the record, okay? Um, the buffer has to be large enough to hold max rex records um, and each record is going to be 1,024 10, bytes plus the size of either a pre-image or, pre or post-image or a pre-image and a post-image in the case of an update. So you'll need a fairly large buffer if your records are large. Um, but there is 1,024 bytes of overhead uh, and header information that's always included. Okay. Um, so here's a sample insert record that came back from an IFX LO read call. All right, it shows the operation was an insert. Uh, the table is credit card transactions. The owner is uh, Informix. Database is credit DB, right? Uh, the label that we put in, if you noticed, if you paid attention before, we set a label card transaction alert. That's our label. So we can uh, as associate this with a particular kind of event or set of events. There'll also be a transaction ID. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then the commit time, um, which is uh, um, which is a Unix um, um, epic, you know, a Unix time. Um, then there'll be an operation number, um, which may indicate that the transaction has multiple operations, um, and that will keep that that will return the count of this operation within that set. Um, restart log ID is the log the logical log number that contained this transaction originally, and restart log pause is the position within the log if you need to restart um, from this position or after it. Okay. And then there'll be a row data key, and the va and the value contained in the row data key is a you is a um, uh, JSON record that has all of the data, right? So that's going to have uh, uh, whatever fields you ask for. We ask for the UID, we ask for the card ID, we ask for the card data, and in this case, card data in that table was a JSON record itself. So this is an embedded JSON record. If there were multiple card data records, then the card data would return an array of records. And, or actually this whole thing, uh, row data rather, would return an array of records um, if we had specified max rec greater than one. 
okay? Um, now, by default, if, you if the registered client detaches or disconnects from the server, um, its push data session is destroyed. Um, but it is possible in, in I think, uh, F as of FC2 or 3, I forget, um, to create your session, uh, your push data session as detachable so that the client can reconnect to it later. Okay, you do that um, by instead of calling push data register, you call push data detach, uh, detach, set detach. Okay, and again, that returns the session ID. Okay. Um, and then later, if you need to reconnect, you can call push data join uh, with the session ID that you got back from the push data set detach, and you'll reconnect to the existing um, session. Also in some of the later, in the later versions, um, I don't know where this came in, but it wasn't in the original um, um, re, re, detachable sessions, but you can also uh, call push data reset capture um, to change the capture, starting capture position to a particular log ID and log pause, um, right? And if you remember here in the data, we got to start restart log ID and restart log pause as part of the data. So if you keep track of those and your application crashes or fails uh, and you have a way of recovering those numbers, you can restart from where you left off, okay? Um, and also you can, you can roll back to, a, to an earlier position in the logs. Um, if necessary. Okay. Um, and then closing the session. So you call push data deregister, um, okay, with the uh, table, the database, and the owner um, in the JSON record that you pass in as the second argument. Um, you can deregister from all the events that have the same label by passing in the label instead of the, the table information. Okay. Um, or you can um, just end the detachable session um, by calling push data delete. And that gets rid of the detachable session altogether. Okay. Um, you can, if, to end a detachable session that's not attached to a client, uh, a specific session, you can just call push data delete uh, and pass in the session ID instead of no argument. Um, or you can pass in delete all, uh, one to, to delete uh, destroy all push, um, all uh, detachable sessions. Okay. Now, asynchronous post commit data triggers gets a little more complex, and I'm not going to cover the whole thing. Um, and but I think towards the end, I'll show you two two videos that Nagaraju did um, that you'll need to watch to really understand how to do this. Okay. Um, so, as I said, it uses ER, or in, and if in the case of, of capturing uh, data within the same server, uh, using loopback ER to replicate a stored to a stored procedure that can be written in Java or C or, or stored procedure language. Okay. Um, the procedure then, instead of a table, becomes the target of the replication. Um, but the table has to exist um, um, anyway. So if you're replicating data, if you're trying to capture data, let's say from table, um, let's say, you know, transaction, card transaction, okay, um, and you're doing it to a remote server, the card transaction table must exist on the remote server, um, even though you're actually going to replicate to a stored procedure on that server and not to the table itself. It can be an empty table, but it has to exist, okay. Um, just a side note. Okay, and again, once you've got all whoops, once you've got all that data, how'd we get that far? Okay, once you've got all that data, um, all that set up, um, yeah, then we can do the replication. So the first thing is you need an ER group for the source server. Um, if you've set up ER before, you know how to do that. You'll also have to set up a second ER group for this for the same server if uh, for the target server, even if it's the same server. Okay, so that'll be a loopback service um, if, for, if it's to the same server. So you have an ER group for the source, you have an ER group for the target. Okay, in order to create an, a replication to SPL, okay, um, you need to press specify the database and table information for both source and target. So you do a CDR define, uh, find REPL, uh, name the replicant, REP1, okay, um, here we've done always row level, um, 
Our master is the um, uh, group, okay, is the local group. Um, and then uh, we've specified our, our um, dash A and dash R for, for capturing the uh, logged information. Um, and then dash SPL name is the name of the procedure to send the data to. Um, if you want that data will come in as binary data in Informix internal format. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. You can optionally get the data um, in JSON format um, by specifying um, JSON SPL name instead of dash SPL name. Um, choose JSON SPL name and the data will come to you in JSON format instead of binary format. Okay. Um, so here we're set up, we've set up the source, right? Test at G underscore my group, where G underscore my group is the source um, local ER group. Um, okay, informix.table1, select star from table one. Uh, and then the target is test at G underscore loop back in this case, but that could be a remote server group, uh, ER group. Okay, informix table T1, select from T1. Um, and that's pretty much all you have to do once you set that up. The hard part is getting the replication set up uh, if you're doing loopback, okay, and writing the procedure to, to trap the data. There's an optional parameter, dash ca cascade repl. Um, by default, ER does not replicate data that comes into a server from another ER uh, node, um, right? It doesn't pass it along. Um, it depends on the source node to send the data to any other node it wants to send it to. Um, but in the case of um, uh, the post commit triggers and replicating to a stored procedure, you may actually want to be capturing all the data from any server sending data into uh, this server um, where we're doing the capture, um, even though it's coming from another server. So you don't have to do the capture in multiple locations. Uh, in that case, dash dash cascade repl. Uh, we'll tell the system to forward uh, replicated data to the stored procedure as well as locally modified data. Okay. All right, so let's wrap it all up. Um, change data capture real quick. Um, it's an external program that registers to receive notice of data availability. The application has to pull data from the logical logs by doing specific calls. Um, change data is normally available beginning with the current logical log position, although it is possible to, to begin uh, capture from an earlier log position, okay? Once the capture is defined, the client application discon uh, if the client application disconnects, it can reposition to pull data from the previous position. Um, and the data comes in in binary format, okay? Um, so you may have to convert them. Um, it's also possible to request data in, in Java. We didn't talk about that, okay? And, and uh, that's primarily for Java clients uh, using the Java API. Um, this is the Change Data Capture Programmer's Guide online, okay? That's the link. Uh, you can also monitor your Change Data Capture sessions with Onstat GCDC. It'll tell you what's going on and where the log position is currently. Push data triggers, um, captures data changes to the red, from the registered external application as they become available. Um, optionally, the trigger can be detachable so that you can restart it. Optionally, you can reposition within the log, um, okay? Um, and data is forwarded to the application in JSON format. Um, uh, and each JSON document may contain multiple records. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the trigger definition allows you to filter data um, as it's pushed to the client. Um, okay, and there is a separate um, Java and C API for these, uh, which are a little bit different. There's documentation on push data triggers overall and, and also the page for the smart trigger, Java smart trigger API. Asynchronous post commit triggers uses ER either to another server or loop back within the same server. Um, the replicate is defined with on to replicate to a stored procedure uh, as the target instead of a table, although the table has to exist on the target. 
Um, for an SPL target, the data is passed into the procedure as an argument list. For a JSON target procedure, the data is passed to the procedure as a JSON document. Okay. Um, and C procs um, receive a binary record. Processing is initially done by the stored procedure inside the Informix instance um, in the CPU VP um, using the engine's memory ar architecture, but the procedure can certainly pass the data off to ap external applications using uh, um, using um, queues and uh, memory queues and message queues, um, shared memory, and any other method you want to. Uh, to get the data out of Informix and move the processing elsewhere. Okay. And there is the some documentation on replication to SPL from the documentation. And these are two links to the two presentations that uh, Nagaraju made. Um, one is a presentation on post commit triggers uh, and some and a link to the sample code um, that he posted on GitHub. Um, and the other is a presentation he did on loopback replication, which is the hard part, really, uh, of setting this up when you want to do the capture on the source system, okay? And also uh, a link to the GitHub um, sample code that he posted. Um, that's pretty good if you pay attention to both videos um, and look at the code. Uh, it's not hard to implement. Um, and that's pretty much the whole thing. Uh, again, this is just an overview. Okay, um, I hope you're going to do further research um, and you'll have no problems implementing it yourself. Um, if you have questions, you can certainly reach out to me. Um, I know that Nagaraju doesn't uh, object to people reaching out to him either. So uh, let us know if we can help. And that's about it. If we have any questions, um, we'll process those now. Thank you. Okay. So that was... That was my review of uh, change data capture, um, asynchronous post commit triggers, and um, and push data triggers. Um, I hope that you'll all do do some research and find this useful. Um, if you ever need to do this kind of capture, um, I know that it is a great way to migrate data from one place to another to to capture data from Informix and move it to other systems. Um, and uh, thank you for attending.